As one reads the Bible and thinks of its varied types of meaning and then realizes that it's called the bread of life, the food of life. One senses that it contains all the vital elements, the minerals, the vitamins that are necessary for spiritual growth. Sometimes we are loath to study some parts of the Bible. They take a little effort. They seem to be obscure. We lose patience with them. In actual fact, uh, we should lose patience with ourselves. Nothing wrong with the Bible. There's nothing incomprehensible about the Bible that is necessary for us. There are some areas of the Bible beyond which we cannot go because we're not intended to go. The things which are revealed belong to us and to their children and to our children. There are areas beyond which you cannot go. You can try to push your mind into them and go around them and but years of effort later, you're still where you are. But the things that are revealed belong unto us and should be the objects of our study. We have been given warning that only those who have made the Bible the man of their counselor, who have stored their minds with the truths contained in the Bible, will be able to survive the, the delusions of the last days. Satan is going to bring about a strong delusion to seduce, if it's possible, the very elect. Only those who fill their minds with the Bible will be able to survive. I would like to underline something I have said, I suppose, a thousand times in my life. The best way to understand the Bible is to read the Bible. Read the Bible. If you don't understand it this trip through, read it again. And I wouldn't attempt to read the, for study purposes, the whole Bible. I would read the Bible regularly, part of it every day. That's lovely. But concentrate on a, on a section. Really concentrate. Take the book of Galatians. Read the book of Galatians through 50 times. Only a few chapters, just three or four pages in the Bible. Read it, and when you finish, read it again. When you finish, read it again, and you'll be su surprised. But the 30th time, you'll begin to wonder why you didn't understand it before. Now, maybe you're not believing me by the looks of tolerant tolerance that you're looking at me now. You're thinking to yourself, well, that's fine. He's just talking. Fifty times? Read anything fifty times? Uh -uh, not for me. Well, if you're thinking that way, may I suggest again that you read it seventy-five times. Now, that's no joke. If you took one little book, a little book, take the book of Obadiah, it's only one page long, and read that through seventy times, you'll be amazed how much you get out of that book. Now, the best thing to do, if you don't believe me, is try it. Try it. Take a little book. Take the book of Ruth and read it 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 over and over again. Don't read any commentaries. Read the book of Ruth. And I think that's why the Bible has given a few tiny little books. I wouldn't suggest Jeremiah. If you sat down to read Jeremiah and you were a pretty fast reader, it would take you four and a half hours to read Jeremiah. I know because I've timed it. Second time you read it in four hours and twenty-five minutes, and third time you read it in four hours and twenty, and the fourth time in four hours and fifteen minutes, and it gets faster and faster. I've tried this with students over and over again. Read it. Read the Bible. The Bible is God talking to you. And the Bible will talk to you if you read it. 
But if you read one chapter today and tomorrow you pick up the Bible again and you read it and when you're halfway through the chapter you say, ah, I read that yesterday. It suddenly dawns on you. Not much is stuck. But of course you don't do that, but I'm just saying hypothetically if that ever happens. It would never happen to such a sapient group as we are here. But read it. Read it. And God will talk to you from that word. His way, his message, his bread of life, specifically designed in heaven for you. And you will gain all the strengths and all the sinews will be made more powerful to meet all the conflicts that lie ahead. Now today we're going to start with chapter 8 of Hosea. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. Trumpet. First mention, last mention, full mention. Remember the laws of studying the Bible? Trumpet. In the book of Numbers, the whole section here devoted to trumpets. Numbers chapter 10. Make thee two trumpets. Of one whole piece shalt thou make them. Thou mayest use for calling assemblies, for the journeyings, Verse 3, assembling at the tabernacle. If you blow but one trumpet, the princes that are the heads of the thousands shall gather themselves together. When you blow an alarm in the camps, when you blow an alarm the second time, the camps on the south side shall go, the third and the fourth. When the congregation is to be gathered together, verse 7, he shall blow, but not an alarm. The sons of Aaron shall blow an ordinance throughout your generations if you go to war, the enemy oppress you, you will blow at the trumpets, you will be remembered. In the day of your gladness, verse 10, your solemn assemblies, the beginning of your months, here are 20 occasions and more which they to blow the trumpet, different kinds of sounds. One sound for the new moon, one sound for the Sabbath, one sound for journeyings, one sound for assemblings, one sound for supplication, one sound for summoning the presence. Trumpet. I heard behind me a voice like a trumpet. The trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. A trumpet has got a special function. I don't want to spend all the time this evening, but you could, without profit, spend, with a great deal of profit, spend an hour thinking about the uses of the trumpet. And so when Paul says, when the trumpet gives a certain sound, it isn't a sound of certainty. It's one of the calls. The many calls that can go over the trumpet. Now it says, set a trumpet to thy mouth. This is an alarm. This is a warning. He shall come in as an eagle against the house of the Lord. This eagle is used in Habakkuk and Ezekiel and other books of the Bible to describe the descent of Babylon. Lion with eagle's wings. He shall descend like an eagle against the house of the Lord. Why? Because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Two things. Trespassed against my law and transgressed against my covenant. Trespass. To walk over. Trespassing. Trespassers will be prosecuted. You trespass when you put your size 17 boots in territory where you have no business to put them. Trespassers will be prosecuted. Only those who have a legitimate reason to be there. They trespassed against the law walked over its restraints, defied its sanctions, ignored its prohibitions, forgot all about its suggestions. The law. Now the covenant. The covenant is the agreement that God made through Jesus Christ with fallen man to provide man with grace to support and sustain him. That's the new covenant. I will give you grace to enable you to do everything that I demand of you. That's the new covenant. The new covenant is utterly beneficial to man. It's founded in the love of God. It's carried out by the death of Jesus Christ. It's supported and made possible by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives today. The new agreement by which utterly devastated mankind 
puny, impotent, inconsequential could be lifted up and changed by the alchemy of divine providence into stardust to sit with God upon his throne. It's a new covenant. Tremendous compact. In that dateless date before the world was created, the Father and the Son shook hands. Christ became the surety. Tore up my covenant and walked over my law. That's why Israel shall cry unto God, My God, we know thee. And he will say, I don't know you. Depart from me, workers of iniquity. And that day they come and say, oh Lord, we knew thee, we were there, we were the other place, we did this, we did that. And he'll say, I don't know you. Depart from me. Israel had cast off the thing that is good. Therefore, the enemy shall pursue him. Israel did that. Israel had cast off the thing that is good. We are our own worst enemies. Bar none. We cause our own problems. We bring about our own difficulties. By our choices. And here Israel cast off the thing that is good. All that is wrapped up in the good. You remember somebody came to Jesus one time and said, Good master, what good thing shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why call me good? There's none good but God. Somebody was talking to me about three weeks ago and said, Well, that proves Jesus Christ wasn't God. It doesn't do anything of the kind. It proves that he is God. In other words, what Jesus is saying to him, you call me good. If you call me good, you call me God. And if you call me God, you do what I say. And I tell you now to sell what you have and give to the poor. And so when you reject me, whom you've called good, you're rejecting God, who wrote the Tenth Commandment, which you're breaking. This was an acknowledgement that he was God. But what he was trying to do by asking the question is to get that rich young ruler to acknowledge that he was God. And Israel... Cast off that which is good. And when you cast off that which is good, you repudiate God. Therefore, therefore, the enemy shall pursue him. You leave God out of your life and you're the plaything of the adversary. You know there are tremendous pictures in the Bible. I can see Caiaphas standing up in the Sanhedrin not long after the, the resurrection of Lazarus. And he announces to that august body a notable miracle has been wrought and we cannot gainsay it. A stinking corpse has been restored to perfect health. That we know. Now what do we do about it? We destroy the worker of miracles with his miracle. But not on the feast day, lest there be a tumult among the people. That was Satan. See, if Jesus Christ had not been destroyed on the fruit on the feast day, then Christ our Passover would not have been sacrificed for us. And that finger of the ceremonial law that pointed to him as the Paschal Lamb would have been bent out of shape. And Satan knew it. So he tried to get the Sanhedrin by assembly vote to vote that Christ would not be destroyed on the feast day. And in spite of their decision, the concourse of events focused in on that hour when Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Beyond themselves. See, once you sell yourself to the adversary, you can no longer control your activities. The power from beneath controls you. Israel cast off that which is good, the enemy shall pursue him. They set up kings, but not by me. Samuel comes to him and says, Lord, they want a king. They've rejected me. And the Lord says to Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. 
God didn't want them to have kings. Then they set up kings. They wanted the biggest fellow they could get. His name was Saul of Tarsus. And God selected a man called David. David did a wonderful job. David did in 35 years, in spite of all his sins, more than anyone had done in 350 years before him. And his son Solomon undid in 35 years all that David had done. And then Israel chose another king. God didn't choose Jeroboam. He didn't want Jeroboam to go up and start an alternate capital up at Samaria, build another temple, build other cherubim, set up another form of priesthood. He didn't want to do it. He said, they set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew them not. Of their silver and the gold, they made themselves idols that they may cut off. Now, the motivation for their making kings and princes is that they might be like the nations around them. Now, this, from a, from a Christian biblical point of view, is an almost unbelievably stupid decision. To be like the nations round them. Now we can make the same sort of blunders today. We can set up our hospitals like the nations around us. We can set up our schools like the nations around us. We can even organize our pastorate and our churches like the nations around us. And God has got as direct a purpose in education, in medicine, in organization of the church, in preaching of the gospel, as he has in the messages that emerge from the Bible. They're his. And you don't discover them by aping the nations around us. And when Israel said, make us a king, that he may go before us into battle, God never intended them to go into battle. See, they, set, they changed their priorities. They changed their whole direction. And here Hosea is going back over their history, and he's saying, now this is what they did. This is what they did. Not too much earlier than they had done it. See, if Hosea wrote perhaps 775 B.C., less than 200 years before, this whole twist had gone in the wrong direction. And then of their silver and their gold, Material, tangible, visible, mundane, they make themselves gods. God is a spirit. God doesn't want silver and gold as objects of worship. And as soon as they make kings and ape the nations, then they look to silver and gold as that which solves their problems. And then he goes up to Samaria and he uh, uh, apostrophizes the calf of Samaria had cast thee off. Jeroboam made calves of gold. Two of them. And those calves were symbol of the cherubim. You find them all over the Middle East. In Babylon and in Persia and in India and in Egypt. Having seen the symbol of the cherubim at the Garden of Eden when the Descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth fanned out across the world. They took with them the folk memory of the cherubim that had seen in the Garden of Eden and set up symbols as gateways to glory, as gateways to the path to God. And so these calves were set up. The calf became the symbol of the cherub. Remember I compared Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be ere they attain to innocency? For from Israel was it also. The workman made it, therefore it is not God. But the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. Men's hands, mundane materials, these are the objects of worship. These are the central dynamics of life. They still are. When we come to the last chapter of Hosea will get this thought again. When Israel truly repents, she says, Neither will we say to the work of our hands, Ye are our gods. Too many people today look to their work, and their work is their God. Oh yes, God can say something about the Sabbath. God can say something else, but my work is my God. I, I must forget about God's Sabbath. I must forget about something else. I must do my work. So the God that is the dynamic of their thinking, the impelling force in their lives, 
He is not the creator. It's the work of their hands. It's what they're going to do with their silver and their gold, their machinery, their houses, their property. Man made it. Therefore it is not God, although acknowledged. Acknowledged as God and seen by the way it works their lives, regulates them, controls their days and their time, that this is indeed God. But it shall be broken in pieces. They have sown the wind. They shall reap the whirlwind. There'll be no stalk, no plants growing in the ground. Bud shall yield no meal. If it yields, strangers shall swallow it up. What's he trying to say here? There will be no genuine harvest. All right, now what are we sowing for? What are we sowing our families for? What are we sowing our marriages for? What are the seeds we sow? What sort of a harvest can we expect by this kind of seed sowing? In all our relationships, in all our plannings. And when what we do brings forth a harvest, what is that harvest? Will it be food to satisfy us or will there be no stalk? Israel is swallowed up. Now they shall be among the Gentiles as a vessel which is in no pleasure. They've gone up to Assyria. A wild ass alone by himself. Now this is a Hebrew idiom. A wild ass alone by himself was the most honorary critter the Hebrews could conceive. This is what it is. Israel is stubborn. Stubborn. Wild ass by itself, you pull it in one direction, it'll go in the opposite direction. You beat it to go here and it'll go there or sit down. A wild ass alone, by himself. This idiom means that he's stubborn. Israel is like that. Ephraim has hired lovers. Now, as I said to begin with, Ephraim was the most sophisticated, the wealthiest, the most cultured, the most well-read, the highest society among Israel. See, Ephraim's mother was a princess, a millionaire from Egypt, handpicked by Pharaoh to be the wife of Joseph. Joseph was a millionaire. For years and years and years he was prime minister of Egypt. Everything he wanted he had. All the servants, all the money, all the houses, anything he wanted he had. For years and years he was the most honored man in Egypt. He stood before Pharaoh aged 30. He died 110. He was bankrolling his bankroll for 80 years. And Ephraim was at the other end of the will. Only one tragedy with Ephraim, he knew it. Cocky. Unsympathetic. Arrogant idolatrous his superiority to the others was his undoing so in Hosea he's brought up time and time again Ephraim hath hired lovers this is the prostitute yea though they have hired among the nations now will I gather them and they shall sorrow a little for the burden of the king of the princes because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin Altars shall be unto him for a sin. Now notice that. Ephraim made many altars to sin. Now an altar was the center of their worship. An altar was the place of sacrifice. God required the offerings of Israel to be placed on the altar and burned up. May I repeat what I've observed more times than one. If we had to bring our thousand dollar bills instead of our thousand dollar bulls and put them on an altar here in front and watch them go up and smoke, what sort of spirit of devotion would we demonstrate? That's what God expected Israel to do. Bring your thousand dollar bull and burn it on the altar. The best bull you've got. It's mine. 
And I choose to have it burned up as a whole burnt offering on my altar. That was the kind of sacrifice you made. We give 25 cents and we want a receipt. We want to see what comes of it. But if you stood there in the camp of Israel, you'd see what would come of it. In smoke it would ascend. God's trying to show us what devotion and worship is. And he says, they made altars to worship. The altars became to, to sin. They were doing it for what, what they could get out of it. They were devising it for themselves. I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as strange to him. I gave him my Bible. I gave him my law. I gave him the scriptures. I gave him the prophets. But they were strange things to him. There are all sorts of queer things in the Bible. There are also queer things in the book of Moses. I gave them great things in my law. But it was under them, queer. Counted as a strange thing. They sacrifice flesh for sacrifices on my altar and eat it, but the Lord doesn't accept them. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They shall return to Egypt. The bondage. For Israel hath forgotten his maker and buildeth temples. Judah has multiplied fence cities. I'll send a fire upon the cities. It shall devour them and the palaces thereof. In this picture that God is painting here of his people, we see the heart of God. He made a covenant. He gave them his law. He established his altars. He made his system of sacrifice. All these things were forgotten or twisted or mutilated out of all recognition. They became to them a strange and foolish thing. How Satan can get into the mind of Israel and turn him away from the things of God. It is with this tragic scene that we move now into the other parts of the book of, of Hosea where God is appealing to them and showing them an alternate way. We take up our study with that 13th verse of chapter 8. They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of my offerings. That's all they do. It would be like saying they eat bread in the communion service. They drink grape juice in the communion service. That's all it does. So what they're doing is to sacrifice flesh. Their spiritual perceptions are dead. Their insights and comprehension is nil. We can look at the New Testament rituals such as the washing of feet and say all they do is to wash feet. Their minds don't go higher than the shoes that are on the feet. To the sublime insights that this, this is to give, they are utterly ignorant. They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of my offerings. The Lord doesn't accept them. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They have no understanding of the meaning of the sacrifice of Christ typified in this ritual offering. Now what comprehension do we have? What comprehension do we cherish? What comprehension do we develop? Now these are very penetrating statements made by Jehovah through the prophet Hosea. They apply to us just exactly the same as they apply to Israel. We have our offerings. We have our sacrifices. We have our ritual. We have our symbols. We have our ceremonies. What do they mean to us? Are they still pure externals? Or can we see through them? They are the vehicles for a much deeper insight and revelation of what God is doing for us. Israel hath forgotten his maker. 
That's why the first angel's message calls upon men to worship him that made heaven and earth. And what do they do instead? They build temples. Those are the externals. They forget to internalize. They forget to develop the, through meditation the concepts of God as the creator, as the sovereign. They build temples. Visible externals. Judah multiplied fence cities. Material things. I will send a fire upon the cities and it will devour the palaces thereof. They're material. They're destructible. Perishable. Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy as other people. Your joy is not the joy of other people. Some years ago, I took a trip. On this trip, there were several of our friends. It was a study trip. Getting graduate credit for it. Forty-two of us. And we landed eventually in France. And were met by the tour bus. Tour company had arranged to transport us and do all sorts of things. And they had a courier in the bus in which I sat. And this courier began to list for this group of men and women all the intriguing interests of the city of Paris. And after his first five minutes, somebody near to him said, Sir, would you please be quiet? We are not interested in any of these things. We are ministers and scholars. I thought it was a little brusque, if not rude, but he dried up like a prune. And when he sat down, the fellow went to him and explained it. He says, we don't want to know about the nightclubs. We don't want to know telephone numbers of anybody in Paris. We've come here to study. So this kind of talk insults us. And he was wise enough to zip up his frontal orifice. Now what the Lord is saying here, rejoice not, O Israel, for joy as other people. You want to know where you can buy French wine by case lost? You want to buy French perfume by gallons? With no duty? You want to know all the nightclubs? You want to know all the spots? No, you haven't joy as the joy of other people. Your whole idiom of pleasure is something utterly different. And the Lord says to Israel, don't joy as other people. You've actually gone a whoring from your God. You have loved a reward upon every corn floor. The floor on the wine press shall not satisfy them. You won't get anything out of this. The new wine shall fail her. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land. Ephraim shall return to Israel and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. Assyria is Babylon. Ephraim mentioned the 11th chapter of Revelation is a sign of agnosticism. Epitomized by Pharaoh's declaration, who is Yahweh? I don't know Yahweh. I'm not going to listen to Yahweh. So here Hosea is looking right into their minds and telling them, you've gone after the people around you. You're too much like your neighbors. You have a big time and entertainment just like the rest of them. Their joy is your joy. Don't do it. It's corrosive. It's destructive, it's enervating, it turns away from God, it will lead to your end. You'll go down to Egypt, you'll be captured by Babylon. And when they do that, they shall not offer wine offerings unto the Lord. Drink offerings. Now what is the significance of drink offerings? The Lord says, you're not going to offer yourself like a drink offering. 
Hold your finger here and turn to the book of Philippians. It's one of the clearest books in the Bible to show us about a drink offering. Verse 17 of chapter 2. Now chapter 2 deals with the, the incarnation of Jesus Christ in a way that is more moving and more revealing than any other chapter in the Bible. Than any single paragraph that has ever been written in any language in any age. That's the beginning of the second chapter of Philippians. And the punchline in verse 12, Therefore, since Christ has done all this, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you both to will and do his pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that he may be blameless, harmless, sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, nation, among whom he shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, notice this, verse 17, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, what is the margin of that word offered? Poured forth as wine. This is the libation. If you've got some modern versions, it uses the term libation there. Yea, if I am a libation upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice. Now that wine that makes glad the heart of the people of God makes them glad when the wine is poured out on the altar. Not down the throat of some bibulous apostate. This is the wine that makes glad. And Paul says, I am like a libation, joyously poured over your sacrifice. My gratitude for what you have done. Here you are the saints in Philippi. You've gone all through the trouble. When I was jailed there and I was beaten in the earthquake and the Philippian jailer came, maybe the Philippian jailer was reading one of these. He says, my joy is like a wine offering, like a libation, poured over that makes glad. Here I've done something. I laid the foundation you are building now. And my accolades of gratitude and praise are like this drink offering that is poured out over it. They shall not offer the wine offerings to the Lord. See, in the burnt offering, what Israel said is, All I am is God's. That was the significance of the whole burnt offering. All I am is God's. Now, the drink offering or the wine offering is all I have. All the superfluity of my joy and my gratitude and my holiness and everything I have, my devotions, I'm pouring out as an incandescent flame of the drink offering over the burnt offering. Neither shall they be pleasing unto him. Their sacrifices shall be unto them as the bread of mourners. They shall eat thereof, shall be polluted. The bread for their soul shall not come into the house of the Lord. Did their soul no good. See, they built temples, they multiplied altars, they had all sorts of ritual. And the farther away you get from God, the more you need outward ritual and outward sign. That's the fourth verse of the ninth chapter. What will he do in the solemn day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? What are you going to do there? Lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them. Memphis shall bury them. The pleasant places of their silver nettles shall possess them. Thorns shall be in their tabernacle. Now, what's he saying? They came from Egypt. They go right back. Now as we stop and think about that, where did we come from? Where did you come from? When God found you first, where were you? What town were you in? How old were you? What sort of intrinsic value did you have? God has found you. He gave you a new direction, a new dynamic, new guidance. He's lifted you up. 
As I look back on my life, anything that I happen to have done, anything that I happen to have become, I owe entirely to the grace of God. I've seen that over and over again. Large families, four, five, six, seven children. Two, three of them accept the Lord Jesus Christ. The end of their lives is something different. As I'm talking to you now, I can think of one family that I know very well. Many children. Lots of money. One of them became a real Christian. Forty years later, forty-five years later, with all their money, with all they've had, the other one that became a Christian walked away from it far better off. Far, far better off. Family disintegration, pressures, difficulties, problems. Christ solved for the other one. Over the long haul, the principles of God are always right. Always. Going back to Egypt. Going back to where God called you. Surrounded by nettles. Thorns shall be in their tabernacles. The days of visitation are come. The days of recompense are come. One day there will be that day of recompense. He's already told us they've sown the wind and reap the whirlwind. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad for the multitude of their iniquity and their great hatred. First chapter of First Corinthians, Paul takes this up. He says, how many wise men, how many mighty men are called? God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. You know, when you look back I would say Aristotle was one of the smartest men in the pre-Christian era Greek age. Any of you ever read anything that Aristotle wrote? One, two, three, three people. How on earth have the rest of you lived so long without reading it? You mean you haven't missed him? Shall I tell you something? You haven't missed anything. You haven't. He said some wise things, but so have other people. And he said some of the stupidest things you ever came in count. His chemistry, his analysis of the elements of the earth, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Paul on Mars Hill said something that took tremendous courage. He looked over those Greeks and he's having listed the past, he says the days of this ignorance God overlooked. And I wonder whether he ducked when he said that. The first rocks that were coming his way, but the rocks on Mars Hill are very firmly fixed. You can't loosen them too well. He probably realized that. But you know, the Hebrew prophets that were writing before and after Aristotle that were despised by the Greeks have kept on transforming men's lives before Aristotle's time and right down to the present time. All that Aristotle wrote never got anyone a millimeter nearer the kingdom of heaven. Never. Never. And the things of the Hebrew prophets rose transformed men by the million. Changed their lives, changed their direction. And those who were in this sophisticated way, as Paul writing to the Corinthian Greeks was saying, they despised. And so Paul says, God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save. Still doing that. And Hosea writing... Eight centuries before the Apostle Paul. They regard these people as fools. The watchman of Ephraim was with my God. But the prophet is a snare. There were some watchmen there. 
that was with God. That's why they could watch, that's why they could see, because they were with God. But those who actually spoke, he was a snare of the fowler in all his ways and hated in the house of his God. See, Ephraim had his own prophets, but among them there were some seers who could see with the long view, who could look through this apostasy, who could look through this materialism, who could look through this warped humanistic philosophy. They could see because they were with God. But the rest of them, they were as snares of the fowler hated in the house of his God. They have deeply corrupted themselves in the days of Gibeah. Wherefore he will remember their iniquity, he will visit their sins. Then God says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. What a wonderful figure. Grapes in the wilderness. Just to the back of our home in Angwin, there's an old derelict vineyard. It hasn't been used as a vineyard for 50 years. You hardly know it's a vineyard. It's a manzanita, buckthorn forest. A few madrones, a few Douglas firs are growing up now in it. Dense. There's all sorts of trails. Judy and I used to wander all the way through these trails. You've got to know them or you get lost. And here and there we'd look for a, a grape. And there were a few, many acres, but here and there there were some that had survived. And the grapes had gone back to type. When they were fully grown, they were about an eighth of an inch in diameter. And you take a bite in them and you need a steam iron to rearrange your face. <laughs> now they've gone back to type. Now down in the valley they're constantly growing grapes. There were beautiful walnut groves. Miles of them. Here about four years ago they bulldozed them all down. And anyone could have had those walnut butts who wanted to buy them. Some of them were ten inches in diameter. I thought to myself, if I only had a sawmill here, I could furnish 500 houses with the walnut that was here. That was the day before they had the regulation to not to burn, and so they made great piles, and those walnuts disappeared to grow grapes. And when they first put the grape in, they put a tough little local grape. And don't want it for its grape, they want it for its root system. And then when it's a certain age, they don't say that in Napa, but they said that among the, in the, the Hebrews, they circumcised those vines. They grafted in, they budded in, into that root system, whatever kind of wine vine they wanted to get from Spain or Portugal or France or Italy, they would bring these stalks and they would graft them in by the mile. And on that root system that would develop, the rest of the grape would take over. Now the grapes that started from the beginning were these little old wizened, face-twisting, sour, unwanted. He says, remember? He says, remember where I got them? I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. As I saw your fathers as the first ripe fig tree at her first time. No good at all. Needing to be budded. Needing to be grafted. All those walnuts, by the way, were, were grafted. They get a black walnut root and then they put an English walnut graft on the top of it. By the way, when they grow up on the outside, you can't see anything. But if you cut them, I cut one and turned a bowl in it. It's amazing how the fibers twist round. You can see just where they've grown in. It's a very beautiful figure. And so the fig trees too. So these were wild ones. This is where I found you. That's what I asked a little while ago. Where were we when the Lord found us? Like wild grapes in the, in the desert. And I wanted to gather them. I got them. What did they do at Baal Peor? That was where Balaam seduced them. Separated themselves unto that shame. Their abominations were recording as they loved. As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. 
from the birth and from the womb and from the conception. Though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them. There shall not be a man left. Woe, woe also to them when I depart from them. These are very heavy, very strong, very direct appeals that the Lord is making. Ephraim, as I saw Tyrus, is planted in a pleasant place. Hold your finger here and turn to the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 28. Verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him. You know, these proper names in the prophets are all significant. When you say Babylon, you've got a connotation. When you say Tyre or Tyrus, you've got another connotation. Tyrus is the emblem of Satan. Beautifully located. With all the resources of the land and the sea flowing in a rich, unstinted flood. Yet through arrogance and self-sufficiency and pride, breaking everything. Ephraim, as I saw Tyrus, is planted in a pleasant place. But Ephraim shall bring forth children to the murderer. Give them, Lord. What will he give them? Miscarrying womb and dry breasts. All their wickedness is in Gilgal. There I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. And what happened at Gilgal? Hold your finger here and turn to the book of Joshua. Chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. Verse 8, 9 rather, is the climax of the first seven. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Gilgal was at the place that Israel crossed the Jordan and entered into a covenant with God. See, for 40 years there had been no Passover. There had been no sprinkling of the blood. The angel of death had not passed over. The angel of death had stopped. And every Passover, according to the Jewish tradition, 15,000 Jews had died. Until in 40 years, 600,000 of them perished. Now the Passover was reestablished. They were circumcised. They were baptized. They entered into a covenant. Now, what does he say here? For all their wickedness is like Gilgal. They, they began very wonderfully. What did they do? For the wickedness of their doings. Ephraim is smitten. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. My God will cast them away. Because they did not hearken unto him. They shall be wanderers among the nations. And we read the history of the last 2,500 years and see they are wanderers among the nations. Everything exactly fulfilled. Across 2,700 years, the voice of Hosea wails. These judgments came upon them. These problems multiplied. They wouldn't listen. Sometimes they were full of ritualism. Sometimes they multiplied temples. At other times they repudiated everything of God. The pendulum of virtue swung this way and swung that way. They went from materialism to some kind of ritualism to some kind of philosophy. 
aping the nation here, following the kingdom there, forgetting about God all the time. Because you will not repent, you will be wanderers on the face of the earth. How wonderfully accurate this prophecy of God is. How solemnizing, how subduing, and yet how appealing. I take Isaiah's words to ask God's question, what more could I have done for Israel that I did not do unto Israel? What more could God do? Year by year and decade by decade and century by century, he appealed until he moved the Messiah. And all these things are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Let a man examine, him heart, examine his heart and so let him live. How is it with you? What is your relationship with God personally? Let's pray. Eternal Father, these words are heavy on our hearts. They must have been heavy on thy tongue in the long ago and today. Thy frustration sounds across the centuries. Israel's repudiation, Israel's rebellion, our forgetfulness, our revolting, our ignoring, how similar they are. Forgive us, Lord. Open our eyes, open our wills, open our understanding. Possess us by thyself. May the power of the Lord Jesus Christ May the guidance and the teaching and the illumination of thy spirit, may thy love fill our hearts and mold our lives tonight and forever. Amen. You've been listening to Dr. Leslie Harding in association with American Cassette Ministries. This message is part of the Legacy Collection originally recorded in the 1970s. We have digitized the original recordings to obtain the best sound quality possible. International Copyright 2002, American Cassette Ministries. All rights reserved. For additional cassettes by Dr. Leslie Harding or for a free catalog of other American Cassette Ministry cassettes, please contact us as follows. To order toll-free in the United States and Canada, dial 800-233-4450. For international calls, dial 717-652-7000. For fax orders, dial 717-652-9050. Our internet email address is info at americancassette.org. Dr. Harding's cassettes may also be ordered from our secure website at www.americancassette.org. Our entire catalog is online and we accept MasterCard, Visa, and Discover credit cards. Or you may simply write to American Cassette Ministries, Post Office Box 922, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, 17108, in the United States of America. Maintaining the integrity of the Three Angels' message for 27 years, American Cassette Ministries request your continued prayers and financial support as we strive to provide you with the finest, most powerful spiritual messages available. Our one purpose in ministry, to prepare you and your loved ones to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon.